uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, in today's session, we will be um, uh, having our uh, August uh, Customer Insights webinar uh, with uh, Moritz and Leo joining us. Uh, and uh, yeah, good to see you all after the summer break. Um, and um, I want to remind you all that this session is being recorded and we will um, send you a link of the recording after the webinar is finished so that you can um, watch it alone or share it with people who would be interested. We will also share it in our YouTube channel. So um, jo join it and take a look at um, this webinar. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm your host. Today, my name is Maya, and I'm marketing communication manager at Solibri. Uh, we have also with us uh, Peter Peltonen, our new customer success manager. Uh, he will be able to answer uh, your questions. If you have any Solibri related question, here you are. Uh, this is Peter joining us. Thank you. So, um, at any moment, if you have a Solibri related question, don't hesitate to, to ask us and uh, we will be able to, um, to answer it with you. Uh, so for today, we, uh, we have uh, Moritz and uh, Leo joining us. Um, the subject is uh, taking clash detection to the next level. So. That's what we will be talking about uh, mostly, so I, I won't be too long with the introduction. Moritz and Leo we will we'll follow up with a more um, concise introduction of themselves and more uh, insights of the agenda in more detail. So without further ado, Uh, I, I just have one more comment. So if you have any question at any point, please drop it in the chat and it would be very helpful for us if you can state if the question is uh, for Moritz and Leo or for us in Solibri so I can dedicate it to the right person and we will be able to answer you uh, around the end of, uh, of this session. Yes. Moritz, the floor is yours. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Maya. So, first of all, question, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes. So, we're good to go. Uh, first of all, hi to the audience. And so, obviously, the topic is um, taking clash detection to the next level. What we're about to show in the next 40 minutes uh, is our basically development process over the last three years um, coming from a classical approach based on ZOL1, um, the, the basic interference check to what we did with the Zolibri API. And we'll start with the introduction of the company, ourselves, then our classic approach, and then head over to the development process and where we ended up. And obviously we will close uh, with what we have in mind for the next steps. Okay, so let's roll. First of all, a couple of words to uh, um, the company we are with, uh, it's Dresden Sommer. And um, just a couple of key facts. Uh, so founded in 1907, 51 offices um, all over the world and we are uh, internationally active company based in Germany. Uh, we're active in all kind of service areas in the building industry. So just to name a few, it's development consulting, as you can see, project management, engineering and design and real estate consulting, infrastructure and uh, strategic process uh, consulting. And each of these, uh, these departments they have um, an expert team, so the group is called BIM Solutions and we are part of BIM Solutions of um, the engineering part called Integrated Design. Just a couple of key facts here. And so to introduce ourselves, um, probably I start with myself. My name is Moritz Mombur. I'm uh, a senior expert um, in the Integrated Design Department. And I'm the team lead uh, of the digitization team. 
and mostly active when it comes to BIM management and research and development of standards and processes. And I brought with me my colleague, uh, Leo. Yes, so my name is Leo Lopez. I'm currently doing my master's degree in computer science and I'm a working student at Geert and Sommer, also in integrated design. Um, my main focus of activity is in software development and I've been tasked with both uh, process optimization and uh, data visualization here at Case and Sommer. Yeah, thank you. And, that, and that's what came into play uh, in specific uh, when we tackled the Zolibri API and our uh, development of a custom clash rule. And uh, we will see how we tackle this topic. But first, let me start with a general introduction of our approach. And I guess um, some of you will share this approach as well. So um, obviously we get files from various sources and with varying data structures, although based on the IFC scheme, um, depending on the export settings, this might vary a lot. So the first thing we do is usually we classify models. We use the function of classification and our main approaches as well, um, although they are the federated floors, we as well classify the project structure and then we split up um, the various disciplines. And basically just as a rough overview, push this into either um, discipline checks internally or cross discipline checks and then send this to whichever um, kind of communication platform and as well um, to power the eye for data visuals. That's just the rough approach um, from input to output um, in a shortcut. And so we will start with our classic setup and uh, basically why we then headed over to the Zulibri API development. So our classic approach, um, I just had a look in the in the files and the C sets uh, is from 2019. So yeah, roughly three years ago, in October uh, 2019, was based on version 9.10. Right now we're at 9.12, and so we straightforward used Zol one for the whole approach. And I will start um, at first with the classification overview. So I guess all of you are quite familiar with the menu. Um, I just added the classification menu here um, to the checking um, uh, menu and or checking layout. And just to give you a rough overview, although it's in German, um, we start in sector A with various classifications according to architecture and split this up by topic or let's say trade, whether for example, 02 underscore um, what is called Rohbau, that these are structural elements, facade, roof, um, fit out and so on. And in each uh, of these classifications, the classification with the number 99 is so to speak um, to exclude elements. And we repeat this approach for the MEP in the same way and C um, basically is the classification system for the project structure. So the various building parts, um, the levels and as well uh, one classification to, to exclude elements uh, for the entry filter. And so probably some of you might think okay um, now we just uh, entered the topic where are the models? At first, we will talk about the structure and then we will head over to the models. So just be patient for a second. So the main idea is we have these classifications for each subtopic by discipline and we um, connect them to what is on top for uh, each area. Master classification to just keep it simple when it comes to filters. And as you can see on the left side, this is uh, already a short uh, glimpse on how our um, rule set was structured back then. And we will go into detail just in the next slides. 
So just to follow this classification structure, when it comes to the um, subclassifications for each trait, obviously we then qualify the model elements further on. For example, in the structural um, part, we split this up by direction, so to speak, whether it's a vertical element saying a column or whether it's a wall or horizontal elements, uh, which is stated here by 0.2 underscore h for horizontal, and then as well material. And we combine this in the ZOL1 filters for selection A and selection B. Just before we head to the rule itself, a short overview and repetition of our approach. So first, we have the um, classifications for the levels, depending on whether the building stories are um, exported in a clean manner and the federated floors work, or if we, if we need to readjust. And then we split up by discipline, as already stated, stated before and then by subtrade like in this part here and then for the architecture we carried on and split this up by direction so whether it's vertical or horizontal and then another qualifier meaning material or let's say according to entity type for example for the fit out whether it's um it's uh, a ceiling or not and then we basically pushed this into the ZOL1. And when we had to split up by entity, whether it's a wall stair and so on, this is where ZOL1 in the result tree takes over. Just to see how this looks like and what it meant according to the approach, we right here um, see just uh, um, uh, intro of our rule rule structure and so on the right side you see the classifications and then on the left side you see the rule set structure and it was basically by uh, trade and then by level and then uh, it drills down um, through all the structures uh, so to speak uh, by direction and then each direction and material against each trait um, for the MEP. And this meant in this approach for this single rule set, 10 levels, you already can see what's stated there. And it ended up in 4,200 4, rules and 600 folders. Uh, and this was just for one tolerance type. So um, obviously, we followed this approach to push this then uh, via export to, for example, Excel or Power BI. But yeah, it was a lot of work. And obviously, since you had to um, enter each ZOL1 to change, for example, the tolerance, uh, this was as well um, something we had in mind when we headed over to our own development to make, the, make this more flexible and adjustable without um, the need to adjust 4,200 rules. So just to get an idea how we basically push this into the selection. Here is a short overview. Obviously, you can see the whole filter is based on classifications on four levels, uh, which we already got to know before. And A is according to selection. B means the type of check and the tolerance. C in this case means which elements to ignore, to exclude, and you could configure this even further on. And then we have the severity parameters. And this was something obviously ZOL1 offers a lot of functionalities. Um, if you already have a standardized structure in mind, and we wanted to transfer this to our custom rule, and then in some parts, push it even further. So one main goal is or was to make the reconfiguration more uh, dynamic and easy. And another goal was to make this here um, configurable. So the result tree 
And just to sum this up, I guess uh, quite a lot of you already know what's happening there. Uh, we have um, the clash name itself, which relies in a way, for example, on element type and then system. And uh, in specific, IFC system, when uh, working with varying data structures from various consultants, often was quite of a challenge because um, they might did not export the, the system info to IFC system in the right manner. And so it was always on undefined and we wanted to use our classifications to bypass this. And as well, there is a description which is already transferred and we wanted to make the issue name and the issue description um, configurable based on our complete setup. Um, yeah, mainly on classifications. And so if you transfer this to the issue menu, obviously this real repeats. So issue name and issue description. And as I said, we wanted to, or we had the strong wish to make this configurable. If you somehow automate this, that it uh, becomes yeah, even more meaningful to uh, people who receive this. Um, either coming to Zolibri, another viewer, or um, for example, for uh, export of PDF or Excel. And so, what do we do? What uh, did we do from here? And with all the structure and the standards we had in mind and already set up in 2019, yeah, we had it over. Um, since then, a lot happened, uh, Zolibri API became ava available. Um, now we're in 2022, version 9.12, and this was just the right time to make this happen. And so what do we want to make this happen? So we will now um, at first give you an insight on um, nowadays status and where the development journey took us. So first of all, here now, a couple of models come into play, as you can obviously see. Um, thanks a lot to the client and to RKW architecture for the approval to use this. One remark, um, these are just examples, not uh, all, the, all the results are not based on uh, actual status, just to keep this in mind for the viewer. And so now we will head over to our nowadays um, setup. Yeah, the same approach repeats. As you can see, um, in the meanwhile, uh, folders for classifications to organize the, the classification menu were introduced, and we still follow the same approach. Um, a couple of classifications for architecture, then for MEP as well following the idea of a master classification. And then we introduced again, or um, kept the classifications for the project structure. And one main thing that's quite interesting is we wanted to make um, the single results available or uh, by zone. So we introduced another model we set up on our own here, a simplified ver a version, which are just volumes and we export them, classify them, and we will later on see what we do with these zones. Then we followed the same approach with a subclassification per trade. As you can see here, um, it follows the same logic. Um, although we now introduced another one. One is um, to classify, let's say, by qualifier, in this case, material by trade, and another one is to split up by direction. And just to give you an idea, because our process obviously is we get uh, files, and then um, we, I, I will not show it just as a short wrap up. Uh, we use the information takeoff uh, to search for repetitive patterns and then we classify and this will automatically automatically take it to the second um, classification but just to give you an insight for example on this classification it's just a couple of entries 
um, according to material, whether it's from top to bottom, precast steel, wood, concrete, brick, or something else undefined. And we try to keep it um, uh, simple. So only a couple of system fields, which usually um, hold a value um, to not get widespread filters and to keep this consistent. This repeats in, in all the classifications. And uh, we followed the same approach for the MEP, although there our main entry is according to system. And uh, there we as well introduce uh, the color coding to get an overview of the MEP systems. And so what uh, should we do with what we have seen so far? Obviously, we could take the approach from before a lot further, even more rules, um, brute force, ZOL 1, or we just introduce uh, the Zolibri API approach um, in specific to make the, the single rules externally configurable. And so probably, Leo, you can give us a hint. What are the main features? What were we looking for? So as you already told us, uh, the, well, the main idea was to make this configurable uh, externally so that we could exchange configurations. We could copy and paste, uh, search and replace, uh, all those things that we couldn't do in the parameter window. And also what we wanted to do is to make the result structure more dynamic. So before we had um, to define all those floors, for example, uh, where we wanted uh, our results to reside in. And now if you see in the bottom left results, uh, we still have those floors, but they are nowhere to be found in the config. Uh, and those will only come from the classifications. Uh, what you also told us about was uh, the issue name and description. And yes, we also uh, did some work there to be able to uh, generate names and meaningful descriptions on the fly um, while still keeping the Solibri Sol 1 uh, features with uh, severity overrides and stuff like uh, yeah, system references and tolerance overrides. Okay. So uh, cool, and we will see in a minute um, how this looks like uh, in, a, in a real result. And um, just as a short comparison, uh, what we ended up right now, if you just have a look, uh, look on the left side, obviously, we ended up with 11 rules in two folders. Uh, if we skip the, the root folder, and this means just by numbers, I definitely don't have to read them out, but obviously uh, a lot less, uh, which is already good. Although you could split up if you need, um, if you have a big uh, project and you need uh, to already work on results, because we pushed everything into, so to speak, a group rule. And the main idea is just to sum this up one, one rule to check them all in a way. Um, and this is uh, the path we followed. And so let's head over to a couple of the results and how this feels like uh, when working with it. Okay, obviously uh, what you see right here is um, in the result tree structure um, and the corresponding 3D view um, that the result tree structure now follows, um, for example, levels. And the levels are not based on federated floors, but our classification for the levels and obviously the classification entries. Um, for the next slide, Leo, what's what's happening here? So yeah, now um, below the floor category, we uh, drill deeper. Uh, now we can see our two zones A and B being uh, grouped, or the, the issues being grouped into those two zones. And these again are based on the classifications that we showed beforehand. And the way we did this was basically for each clash, uh, take the, the intersection body, compute the centroid of this intersection body, and then check if this centroid would be in any of those uh, yeah, volumetric bodies that we define as zones. And okay. 
that's that's all already it. right right now this is the view when it comes to just um the first level above ground but let's see because you already spoiled what what's happening when when it comes to zone let's see when we select for example zone right. a okay so um here you can see the the result structure splits up and what we see below on the left side um, are the testing groups. Um, as I said, we entered a couple or combined a couple of tests. In this case, this is um, structure from architectural side against all MEP traits. And this is what the coding means right there. Um, for example, from top to bottom, uh, this is ventilation, sanitary, public health, heating and cooling and uh, electricity. So just to give you an idea, and obviously on the right side, on the bottom, you see the corresponding um, classifications, and uh, this is the, saw, uh, the target, so to speak. On the next slide, we drill down even further. And um, in this example, this is just the test in between structural elements and um, ventilation. And what you can see when you probably first look to the right side, to the classification, this is the main classification or the first group uh, where it splits up according to material. And you see that these entries repeat in the result structure. So if I just want to have a look, for example, on um, elements uh, concrete elements which um, collide with uh, ventilation you could and you could go even further because then it splits up um, into vertical and horizontal as you can see here and if you have a close look uh, for example on the issue naming right here we will we will dive deeper just in a second but here probably first let's have a look at the source object um we as well made this configurable the naming right here what's happening as well leo uh, i think one thing that should be noted here is that the only thing we're reading from our config file is the group name Everything else is just references, and we're taking those informations from the specifications. Um, so yeah, what we do here is define a kind of pattern for the source object, and then we can group uh, all clashes for one source object in meaningful categories. So this wall, for example, will collide with two objects, and this can be grouped into one larger issue. Okay and the next step is the issue name itself and as you can see um or probably by your experience this differs quite a lot from uh what the what the hard-coded version offers so we made here according to the issue name and as well the description all our classifications available or any other um entry from for example uh the the various menus um, starting with uh, Leo. The identification tab, uh, we, yeah. could use, we could also use classifications or the custom properties, right? Yeah, custom properties meaning real custom properties or as well <laughs> including all the property sets um, from the IFC, uh, IFC scheme. So um, heading over to the issue menu, um, let's have a look on the structure of the strings. So first, the issue name. And here, um, uh, a clearer view. Obviously, we reuse our architectural classifications. Then um, this, the architectural files are uh, created um, using Revit. So we use the BUT ID then a free text, meaning verses, and then our MEP classifications and the MEP files um, are uh, constructed uh, using MicroStation TreeCut. So we use the MicroStation ID right in here. And when it comes to description, 
we reordered a couple of them but you could yeah uh, configure this in whichever way you like and as well if for example a certain entry does not hold a value you can already um, work with default values to skip for example um, entries which hold no value and we added right here levels and zones and due to the fact that we could not uh, uh, basically access the position field that's um, probably in a way a feature request for an, an upcoming release to make this available via Zulibri API but as you see full flexibility not only when it comes to the result tree but as well when it comes to um, the source object naming the issue name and the issue description and um, just to give you an idea what the menu looks like. Leo, can you tell us a bit uh, of the interface um, you worked yes. on? So uh, on the very top, we have section A. This is the section where, we'll, uh, where you would yeah, do most of your configuration. Um, so you point the rule to an Excel file containing the config and then also to a sheet. So you could group several configs into one big file and then access those by sheet. Uh, and at the bottom, we have a checkbox um, whether this specific rule should export its results or not. Um, then section B should not need to be changed, but could be changed. So here we point the rule to all of our master classifications for both architecture and MEP. And we have those three levels that Moritz talked beforehand. And in the okay, very... Okay. <laughs> Probably one addition because yes. um, obviously we point to uh, what we already set up in our standard um, just to give a hint what's about to happen at the very end. We, we need these entries to have a consistent um, yeah, filtering uh, for Power BI. Uh, th this is as well um, uh, the meaning of this exactly. menu. And then on the very bottom. Yes, section C is kind of our uh, solubly uh, API related worries. Um, so um, we had this issue where if you changed something in the config file, uh, you could not run the rule again because from Solibri's perspective, nothing had changed. The model had stayed the same and the parameters had stayed the same. So the checking would skip this rule. So what we introduced was this refresh parameter you can see at the bottom which is just a check a checkbox and it will have no effect on the uh, on the results. And we also needed a, a component filter because every rule needs a component filter, which will just include every component. So we can then select components within our rule. Okay, and probably as well, uh, when it comes to this topic, uh, there are rules um, uh, pre-made which offer, as you might know, uh, for example, certain uh, functions to um, update uh, the connection to a related Excel file. And probably in the future, this will be as well, uh, as well available via API would be cool. And then we could skip this step. Yes. And next we head over. Obviously, we uh, already spoiled a lot about our approach and configuration file. This is what it looks like, the mysterious configuration file. And um, can you give us an insight on what's happening here, Leo? Um, yeah, so the red box you see at the top uh, will give an overall configuration area of the rule. And uh, if you click once, you will also see the highlight for our categories. Um, so here we can see our structure. We will first group by floor, then zone, then our groups then the classification results, uh, then under the orientation and by source object. And the way we implement it is, is we have several keywords that you can just rearrange or delete or insert as much as you want. Uh, and the rule will pass this and then uh, generate the, uh, uh, the issues accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, we also have our links for the zones and floors here. Uh, and at the very bottom of uh, a source object format string, but we will come to that later. Yeah, so the, the source object, meaning the element um, as well in Zool 1, uh, which the single issues are grouped by. 
So um, we, we as well made this configurable. And um, to give you an idea how this might look like if we reconfigure. So we head over to a configuration file uh, for the MEP. This is why on the uh, bottom left, you see as well uh, the coding for the various traits you already got to know. And what we entered here, just to be super specific, is grouping by room. Yeah. Um, and to give you an idea uh, how this looks like, uh, we will jump back into Solibri. And here, obviously, then we restructured um, all the results um, according to the structure by room. This is um, an MEP central for public health. And due to the fact that um, right here, obviously, you, you see the room and you see the room uh, name and number. And then you see the checking group as well. Um, due to the fact that um, right now the uh, related components menu is not accessible via API, we then uh, used again our um, classifications to basically end up in the same point and just um, that you get a short idea of uh, how this might look like in a workflow. Obviously, you can then um, as well blend in the related traits for the MEP. Uh, just in a couple of steps. Okay, so heading back to our configuration file, there's a lot more to see. So um, the next area, obviously just a general uh, reminder. We wanted to make this configurable via Excel because obviously um, you could simplify this a lot more, but um, Excel is something, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it low tech, but it's quite accessible and a lot of people know how to use it. So um, this is why we chose this approach. And in the second part of our, so to speak, Excel menu, um, Leo, what's happening here? Uh, so this is the definition for one of those checking groups. Um, at the top in blue, uh, we can see the group's name and now highlighted, we can see uh, the, our selection mechanism for the components. So we have our source and target component set, and these will just once again reference uh, to a classification in Solibri, uh, which we will then check. It's selection A and selection B, so to speak, what to clash against each other. And then um, the next part, quite crucial. Yes, so the next part uh, is basically what we carried over from the Sol1, um, which is the tolerance type. Uh, and the tolerance values, uh, and then also uh, the ability to filter the collisions by either duplicates um, or collisions where one object is completely inside another object, or our like classic overlap clash. And we also added a fourth param a parameter for the case if you wanted to um, test one classification against itself to reduce duplicate results there. Just uh, to remind ourselves uh, of the slide where we introduced the ZOL1, that's basically the translation of um, area A, where you have uh, component A versus component B. And then it's the part, uh, what we call B, so to speak, where to configure which type of check has to be executed with which tolerance. And uh, then um, C, where you could type in, okay, uh, if elements are um, from in the same model and they share the same system, you should skip the, the clash, uh, so to speak. Um, this is, uh, so to speak, directly uh, transferred. But now the nice, the real nice part right here. Yes, so uh, this is one, one of our main features, I'd say. Um, so you can see uh, there's a bunch of a bunch of text there. And what we did was uh, we um, got a substitution engine and we can basically have those um, those variables that you can see there be replaced with actual values in each issue case. So for example, with the issue name, you can see it starts by getting the value of a classification of the source object. Um, and in further down to the right, you can see we also get this source.bet ID, 
and uh, yeah, we can freely manipulate, manipulate these and insert custom text. We can insert values. We can basically do whatever we want uh, to make these issue names as speaking as possible. This sounds fantastic. So uh, the total freedom, freedom to automatically <laughs> name uh, all the issues in a meaningful way. Um, and complete independence of any varying data uh, data input, so to speak. Uh, so in a way, a defense line. Um, that, that sounds really good. This was uh, as well one of the main things besides the flexibility to make this external configurable. Yes, and one thing to add here is uh, what I also told before, that in the source object format in the top, we can also see the same template strings happening that we have in the issue name description. Okay, so um, uh, when it comes to, for example, an internal workflow, we always stick with the same configuration um, template. Uh, if we have varying data sources, we can adjust after short analysis the string and still um, end up with a meaningful description. That's cool. So um, the next part on the very bottom, Yes, so the next part will uh, mostly be severity and tolerance overrides. So uh, what we had in SOL1 was um, this way to dynamically change the severity of an issue depending on certain conditions. And we wanted to keep that in our rule. So what we did was we have this overall criticality uh, moderate here at the top. And then in the bottom table, we can override both severity and the tolerance used uh, per check um, for all components as needed. And the way we do this is in the very left column, uh, we first specify if we want to operate on our source on, or on our target uh, components. And then uh, we again use those template strings to kind of put together a, a value string that we can then match against with uh, regular expressions so a really mighty tool to yeah, be able to dynamically uh, match whatever uh, contents you, you might want to match. Oh. Um, so you can see we once again are accessing classifications of components here, but we could again, I don't know, match by bed ID, by object types, by IFC types, whatever we wanted. And then the match string is basically what we want to accept. So either uh, yeah, just one, va one value or several values. Um, and then we can exclude uh, components with that max keyword you see on the bottom right, um, or just put in some, some specific tolerance override value. Or on the very right, you can see we set some components to critical or low, depending on the specifications they're in. OK, and the, the overall severity right now is moderate. So, exactly. um, okay, this is the override, and here we as well can exclude elements, really cool, and we uh, over, uh, overcome the limitation of basically when you have a lot of any um, filters, you cannot build an end or condition in between filter groups. So, this is probably just uh, something that as well came with this approach. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nice side effect. RecX. Um, implementation or usability that's really cool and um, yeah uh, if you um, don't follow the approach uh, according to Zulipi API obviously if you have your classification system completely in line uh, you could follow this or uh, identical approach although then you have to end up with a lot of rules um, using uh, selection A selection B and then the severity parameters uh, on top. You could reproduce this. Okay, um, so for all the coding, we uh, added as well a sheet right here. Um, can you give us a hint what, what the single uh, um, strings are about? Yes, so in the uh, top, we can see specific um, clash parameters or clash variables. So you could insert the um, volume of the intersection body or the to uh, tolerance that was used or the default tolerance, the group's name, uh, stuff like that. And then if you click once more, um, 
uh, we can see that these are the uh, source and target specific uh, values that you could insert. So this is basically a one-to-one -one copy of what you would see in the solidary uh, identification tab of an object. Um, and in addition to that, we can also, as we've shown, um, access all classification data and all custom property sets. So we can respond to varying model quality, let's say. Cool. And this is um, how such a classific uh, how such a configuration um, in a sheet looks like. Just to probably relate back to what we've already seen. Um, these are the various tests. This, these are structural elements against ventilation, and then all the other tri traits. And as you see, we reuse the coding everywhere. And obviously, there was a button saying export results as well. So um, you might uh, want to uh, have a look according to how this looks like or ends up. Yeah, basically raw data and a lot of columns. Um, we reuse what we set up from the very beginning everywhere um, in each step of the process. And so what to do from here? Um, obviously, our idea was um, since right now, uh, the Zolibri score is not fully adjustable. This would be cool if it, if, if it uh, would be adjustable in the future. Um, Right here, we have the raw export, um, and each time we export uh, for each data drop, it gets a new timestamp. Um, we will see what we will do with the various timestamps in a minute. And um, so we push this over to Power BI. Um, here you can get a first view on the page structure. And obviously, we have like a landing page where it gives an overview um, according to uh both uh, either um, cross discipline uh, checks or uh, clash overview for the MEP meaning here B BSA BSE and building services engineering and um, then we um, offer the users um, for each topic uh, separate pages for example, here, um, architecture versus MEP. And we reuse all the data we created right here for the filters. So um, one level below, there's a detail section where you see the various um, clashes split up by level. And then um, on the bottom left, clash count, obviously, um, uh, the in this gun chart, the, um, the various color codes for the MEP traits and the history, how this uh, worked out over time. Yeah, and right here, um, Leo invested a lot of time to make this pixel perfect. Can you tell us a bit what is about to happen here? Um, yes, so we can drill down by all those uh, by all this information that we collected before. So now, for example, we can select a zone to group by or to filter by, uh, and this will reduce uh, all the information in the dashboard below. And then if you wanted to further uh, in investigate one area of your project, you could then um, take the, the next slicer and uh, really reduce all the, the issues that you're seeing on the bottom until you're at that issue that you want to see. Yeah. So um, a repetition of what we had before, let's say at the classifications for architecture, the classifications for MEP, the classifications for the project truck, uh, structure, meaning zones, meaning levels, and we can reuse this right here. Okay. So for example, here, the trade only structural elements against MEP. Um, in zone uh, for for the lower levels, and then we could drill down uh, drill down further on. It's dynamically, so uh, you don't uh, always have the same options. It gets less and less. For example, concrete elements right here, and then let's say by direction, what you have already seen before, our classification results of the subclassification for an architectural trade. 
and the same for the MEP. So um, how can we end? Uh, that was basically a part of our journey so far. And we just want to give you an insight what our next steps um, can be. Uh, so from top to bottom, Leo, make the first yeah, move. The custom rule. All right. So as I mentioned in the parameter interface, this section C we had, we want to get rid of it by using things like a file picker maybe, uh, or a, a, a proper refresh button, not the little, little hack we had. Yeah. Um, we also want to get rid of uh, the default component filter because we really don't need it and we want to just include all components. Um, the access to related components as seen in uh, SOL 1, um, but that is announced uh, to be included in the next major release. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and we want to skip the actual export step and write our results directly into an SQL database, uh, which Power BI uses anyways for its visualization. Um, okay. For, yeah, for the concrete part, part right. probably let me take over <laughs> just, uh, just on this part. Um, so uh, obviously, as you see, our approach is quite rough right now uh, when it comes to Excel, and we somehow want to make this guided for the user, um, probably push it either to SharePoint, um, which is fairly easy, but obviously we want some kind of a real interface or push it to a web interface, um, especially when it comes to grouping that users without having to type in some stuff, but either to pick from, uh, for example, drop-down menus can configure this. And obviously with the next um, huge step, uh, or big step, we want to head over to Autorun to completely reuse this um, based on, on a reliable infrastructure. And when there's a data drop, we want Autorun to uh, continuously execute these checks to update the dashboards and um, have this um, over, for example, to, to a platform or whatever. And um, it would be really nice if we could use all the, so to speak, metadata right now store an issue name or description, obviously, because we have total freedom. We would like to reuse this to um, yeah, uh, give the, the issues um, a specific meaning, saying who's responsible, deadlines, priorities, just to head over this metadata um, as automated as possible. And um, coming to Power BI, Leo, what are the next steps there? Um, first of all, we want to implement a, uh, implement a mobile layout because right now on, on desktop, it looks quite nice. Uh, on mobile, it quite doesn't. And um, yeah, we also want stronger menu guidance to um, assist the user in filling down those flashes, what we had now with those eight, 12 uh, slicers at the top. We want to reduce um, for the, for the end user. Okay, and, and probably the last big step, obviously, since we said, okay, it would be really cool to uh, make uh, Solibri score adjustable. Obviously, right now with our approach, we would like to somehow have a relation back in between Power BI and Solibri. If you uh, enter a certain slicer or um, a dynamic filter, it should directly show what, what's happening in Power BI and Solibri. I mean, this is a huge step, but we're, we're looking forward to this. And obviously, the journey will not end. Um, probably uh, just to give you a hint, head over to um, the Zolibri Society. You'll find a lot of uh, like all the stuff we reuse to start our journey when it comes to API, when it comes to discussions um, with other users, how to tackle several problems or talk to the developers. Uh, I'm unsure, Maya, if this was was part of what you had to say, <laughs> but uh, I guess we I guess we split up. Um, okay, so that's it from our side. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, thank you so much, Moritz and Leo. Leo, this was very informative and very nice, and thank you for reminding our uh, viewers to join um, the Solibri Society. So that's where all the power users, such as yourselves, are. Uh, located so you can share experiences there and and uh, 
um, if you have questions, we we um, we help each other to to solve problems and uh, answer questions. But yes, uh, thank you so much. I will uh, take over the view uh, and share my presentation. Yes, so uh, it, we we have received some questions, um, uh, but uh, uh, I don't think we will have time to answer them all. But don't worry. Uh, if you have questions, uh, drop it down. I have your emails. I have your questions, and we will have time to answer it after the um, uh, the webinar. If not uh, uh, through your emails, then uh, in in the um, in the webinar a brief uh, on our website and after the webinar i'll be sending you a link to uh, to the brief and also to uh, the recording on youtube uh, there will be also a, a feedback form so if you have any feedback please let us know there okay but yes be so before before we start with the questions i forgot something so um if you for example um uh, if you need a custom rule uh, just drop us a line on LinkedIn um, and we will see what we can do about it. Um, and if you would like to work with the Dresden Sommer team uh, in specific BIM solutions as well, just drop me a line and we get in touch. Okay, so um, let's start with the questions. Yeah, uh, Leo, I've shared with you some questions. Would you like to choose choose them or should I? Uh, I try that. to answer some like on the side, but if you could choose some questions for us, that would be great. Yes, so um, I I will see here that there is um, uh, how how can you react to models or model parts with wrong or missing IFC classification? For example, building element uh, proxies. In my understanding, they would be excluded from your checking. Um, uh, uh, or uh, is that uh, asserted by your internal classification? Yeah. OK, uh, yeah, uh, this is why the whole approach is based on uh, the function classifications. Because, for example, if you get um, structural beams uh, from Revit and they are um, in the mapping table are not defined as being exported as IFC beam, we can still include them as IFC beam via the classification. For example, um, what we have seen um, for uh, the structural elements. And so first um, you classify, for example, the material and in the second step you can say, okay, this building element proxy, if you at least get some hint um, that, it's a, that it's a beam, you can either classify it by, um, let's say, an entry in any kind of um, P-set uh, coming from identification to custom properties or, and this is as well uh, a major plus in the approach, if there's very less information, we as well can use manual classifications. So you can select elements and say, okay, this is a beam and it will uh, be checked as a beam. All right, thank you, Moritz. I hope this answered your question. Another question, is there a way uh, in the Excel to filter out uh, the clashes if there are uh, at the place of an Deutsch Ber, Ber uh, Leo, it's, it's in uh, German. Yes. Yes, Durchbruch. Durchbruch, yeah. yes. Um, right now, I don't think we have this feature implemented unless we did it implicitly but but to be honest we we could because we could use for a classification an opening like a room <laughs> and, and <laughs> group of, so in, in fact we can yeah uh, because the system itself according to the approach not how it's set up right now offers a lot of possibilities so we could hopefully this answers the question um yes hopefully thank you so much um i'm trying to look at questions because we're receiving some last minute questions but unfortunately we can't answer them all and we're uh running out of time so if you if you 
if we weren't able to answer your question, please uh, wait for me to send you the answer via email and you will anyhow receive an email of um, the updates uh, from us. But uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Moritz and Leo. Th this was really nice and really informative. And um, and uh, yeah, so so look forward to uh, to doing the next steps with you uh, as well in the future. Nice. Yeah, we too. Thank Thanks you. a lot for for uh, the possibility to present. And um, yeah, hopefully was not only informative but uh, you had some fun uh, while we presented and so um, i mean it's obviously about coordination but as well i mean it's a fun topic so um let's share experience and take this even further okay yeah. but before everyone leaves uh, i i would like to uh, let you know that we have uh, a webinar coming up uh, in September. So we're continuing with our Customer Insights webinar series. Uh, and the topic will be implementation of quality control using Solibri. So uh, let's, let's see you then. And uh, don't forget to give us a feedback if you have any and reach me or uh, Peter uh, via these um, uh, emails as you, you can see on the screen. But uh, Yes, thank you so much all for joining us. Thank you, Leon Moritz, and I will see you all uh, next next month. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye bye.